as they exchange uh, microphones there, our next speaker is uh, Yoshiaki Shibata. He's from Japan. And he started his career in semiconductor research at Sony in 1991. He's got some experience. He moved into uh, IT multimedia in 96 and worked on uh, video compression technology, very involved with MPEG-7, which is not a compression technology, but still involved with uh, moving. That's actually a metadata standard, right? Yeah, M uh, MPEG-7. He was very involved with SMPTE 330, which is a UMID specification. He's going to talk about UMID since his, uh, his talk is UMID applications in practice, not just in theory. 2002, he took part in the XDCAM development for Sony and played a crucial role in the metadata aspects of that. And here's, here's when, uh, Yoshi, when uh, Mr. Shibata went out on a limb. He decided to make a trial for himself and his family here to be the f Japan's first freelance consultant for the media and metadata technology under the name of Meta Frontier. And we'll hear from Yoshiaki. Thank you, Ari. Can you hear me? Uh, no. Let's see if it's on. It, yeah, it should be. Ah. Yeah, now it's on. OK. Thank you, Ari. I'm pleased to be here to make this presentation. This is an outline of my talk. First, I'll briefly introduce what is the UMID. Then I'll uh, move to the generic discussion of UMID application as an every material identifier. Then I'll talk about a UMID application specifically for MXF, and uh, I'll slightly touch upon the UMID resolution protocol before concluding my talk. So, what is the UMID? UMID is a uh, an uh, acronym of Unique Material Identifier, which is specified in SEMP T330 and RP205. Based on the well-known SEMP T metadata technology, UMID also takes the form of key length value uh, or key uh, KLB structure. Here, the first 12 byte key corresponds to the universal label, which indicates this is UMID. Then, uh, one byte length, uh, which uh, indicates the length of value field in byte, which is fixed to 13 in hexadecimal number in the case of UMID. Then in the value part, uh, there are the two components. One is a three byte instance number to indicate that this is an instance of every material, and the material number uh, to accommodate a global unique value, which actually makes the UMID as a global unique value. So there are two distinct uses of UMID. First, of course, uh, UMID uh, can be used as a unique material identifier. Here, uh, when you create a new material by acquisition, then you need to new, uh, create a new UMID value and attach it to the material. In this case, the uh, instance number uh, must be fixed to zero in order to indicate that this is the original material. And another use of UMID is as a linking tool. Suppose uh, you have a source material and you will uh, partially retrieve a resulting material by in point and out point. In this case, uh, you have an option that, uh, to attach such a UMID that it shares the material number with the source material UMID, but uh, the non-zero instance number in order to indicate this is not uh, original material. But the problem here is that those two uses of UMID are mutually exclusive. Because suppose you are using a link, UMID as a linking tool, then somebody you don't know might uh, retrieve, uh, might conduct a partial retrieval, but a different duration, but happen to assign uh, a material number, uh, the same material number as one. So in this case, uh, the, uh, identify uh, cannot be used. So in this presentation, we, we are mainly focused on the UMID as an identifier, uh, so which means the instance number is usually set to zero. Here, this is a generic discussion of UMID application as an every material identifier. By the way, uh, why do we introduce a UMID? Uh, actually, it, it is standardized in, uh, 10 years ago. I believe one of the scenarios we want to achieve is this UMID based every material search. Because of a huge difference in data size between every material and metadata, it is natural to set up a material database separate uh, independently. And, uh, and uh, while uh, every material will be stored 
in the storage device connected uh, in the network, we will collect the metadata separately from the AV uh, material and store them in the metadata database uh, so that uh, we can manage all the metadata uh, in a uniform uh, fashion. So in this case, uh, uh, it is humid which associate the metadata in a database with every material in the storage. So what happens uh, is here. Suppose you want to uh, retrieve uh, pick, uh, every material which capture uh, Ichiro home run scene, then uh, you, the application will give a query like this. Then the uh, metadata database will respond to it by humid, or it is a humid UA material. But humid by itself does not have any, uh, humid by itself does not tell anything about where your desired material is at all. That's why you need to ask the storage device uh, whether you have a humid UA material or not. And in this case, the HDD storage device will respond to it, oh, I have it, and its URL is blah, blah, blah. So here, uh, it is obvious that because each storage device will be coming from a different vendors, so it is important to establish a common conversation method between application asking for UMIT and uh, storage devices respond uh, to it by URL, which we call, uh, I call a uh, UMIT resolution protocol. Another, another example is a UMIT uniform AV material management. It is a common practice for MAMS or media asset management system to assign uh, their own unique identifier to the AV material in order to manage them. And here uh, we have a shared material server which contains several material, and these materials are shared by uh, two MAMS, two independent MAMS. And in this case, for the moment, MAMS1 will name, uh, for example, Japanese style, Taro and Hanako, while uh, MAMS2, the English style, uh, Bob and Alice. And so what happens now is that if we have an application and asking for, uh, do you know ma material Bobs? Then the uh, they ask to the MAMS1. Then uh, MAMS1 cannot but answer, I don't know, because uh, Bob is not within his naming scheme. So what it should be? Here, because uh, each material in the server has already have uh, its own unique name by UMIL. So what is expected for the MAMS is that it, into, it uh, watch the UMIL and store them as their own, uh, as part of their metadata, like this. Then if it, it, if it, it is done, then an application can ask either of the mouse uh, for, uh, well, do you have a humid UA? Then the mouse one, in this case, will respond, oh, I have it, and here, you are lazy like this. So how, uh, what should I do to achieve uh, this kind of scenario? As, uh, as you see in the first scenario, it is obvious that we need to define uh, a, Industry common humid resolution protocol, which means to res which is a method to resolve a given humid of every material to URL. And uh, actually, it is not only uh, sufficient because uh, we, uh, care should be taken to to manage the uh, every material by using humid. So we uh, anyway I need to recommend a humid based every material management. But before that, we need to clarify what the humid application principle, the uh, most fundamental rule which everybody must uh, strictly follow. So what is a uh, uh, humid application principle? Here, th those two principles uh, are sufficient uh, according to our study. First, uh, in order to distinguish the material by using humid, different every material shall be identified different humid. In other words, if a uh, different material happen to have the same humid as shown here, then a uh, humid cannot be used as an identifier anymore. And, and I think this is a very obvious uh, principle. And another one is a uh, humid identification. It seems a little bit controversial, but what we propose as a principle is that what the humid identifier is the essence representation at its play out. 
So as a result, uh, when uh, two material uh, exic exhibit the exactly the same play out result, so a copy uh, in, the, in that sense, but happen to have a title, a different titles for some reason, then uh, we say uh, those material may share the same unit. So this is uh, the principle. So you ha yeah, when you strictly follow this one, then unit can be uh, managed uh, very quick, very uh, appropriately. But uh, I believe uh, this is too uh, abstract uh, for vendors to implement. That's why uh, we will introduce the concept uh, unit managed domain. This is an embodiment of unit application principle. Here, uh, the final goal we want to achieve is a unit resolution. That's why we anyway need to introduce a material manager that manages the, uh, every material uh, with their UMID and URL. In this case, the red uh, broken arrow uh, indicate that the material manager recognizes uh, and recognizes uh, material one, two, four, and five and manages their UMID and URL appropriately. In this case, I would say that material one, two, four, and five constitute the human managed domain. In other words, even though the material exists in the same physical media, medium, such as uh, material three, uh, it is not a part of a human managed domain because it is not recognized a, a material manager. Actually, uh, the UMID in a UMID managed domain must strictly follow the UMID application principle. And uh, so, uh, in order to keep the consistency in the uh, UMID, uh, UMID managed domain, the uh, material manager should take a very important role. Here, I will show a couple of uh, important behavior material manager should take. First, uh, when you import a new material into your material managed, uh, your ma managed domain, then the default behavior is to attach a newly created UMID. Uh, in other words, it, uh, because it, this is because the UMID uh, attached somewhere you, you don't know cannot be guaranteed to be uh, globally unique. In other words, if you create a, a you made by yourself based on the same 330 then its global uniqueness is surely guaranteed. But there is one exception. Suppose the material with you made is coming from another other you made managed domain, then uh, the you, uni, you made uh, must be uh, globally unique. That's why in that case you can reuse that you made as you want. Another behavior I will show is, is for every material modification. Here, suppose uh, you have a copy material and you will uh, modify its essence by insert editor like this. Then what you have to do is to change the, uh, to replace the existing UMID. Here in this case, uh, UMID UE should be changed to another one. Otherwise, uh, the different it happens that the different materials share the same unit, which breaks the UMID, uh, prince, UMID application principle number one. So what's the benefit of uh, UMID managed domain? Here I'll show you a typical uh, network production system from acquisition to the uh, play out and archive. Then uh, suppose they are uh, coming from different vendors, but if they are appropriately support the UMID managed domain, then those unit managed domain can be merged to cover an entire system. This means that now UMID uh, can be used as a common material identifier within entire system. Or if uh, I will, uh, would use a catchy word, this uh, uh, means that now UMID has now become a media IT infrastructure for a media server or famous. Specifically, uh, this uh, enable us to uh, realize a loose coupling between the business layer and the media layer. Furthermore, because UMID is a globally unique, so we can uh, use it as a more globally unique fashion. This, uh, sh program show, uh, this chart shows uh, some, uh, some sites are connected over the internet. And each site uh, 
uh, manage every material by uh, their own way. And suppose there is an external application here, and uh, they want to have a humid UD material, and they happen to have uh, it in site B and site C. And here, because uh, of a different MAMS system and different naming, uh, titling, or genre policy introduced in each site, metadata associated with, uh, it, with those materials should be different. But thanks to the global uniqueness of UMID, if uh, UMID is shared among two materials, it is guaranteed that they, uh, when they play out, their play out result should be identical. That's why the application can access either of uh, whichever he like. Then in this case, uh, the application will access the material uh, in such C because it is in the same uh, sub-network. And in this case, I would say that now media IT infrastructure, uh, UMID has become a media IT infrastructure for media crowds. So far, uh, I have uh, discussed the UMID application, as, uh, generic discussion of UMID application as an identifier, which means that this uh, discussion can be applied uh, to any kind of media file, such as QuickTime or MP4. But from now on, uh, I will more specifically on the UMID application of MXF. Before discussing the MXF, uh, UMID discussion in MXF, uh, I will quickly overview the MXF. MXF is a material exchange format, an uh, acronym of material exchange format, which is uh, specified in the 7377 and their family document. MXF actually is composed of a concatenated uh, KLV a packet uh, physically, but logically they form a file header, file body, and file footer. Here, the file header contains so-called metadata, uh, MXF header metadata, and the file body contains so-called uh, uh, have so-called essence container, which actually contains the AV metadata, uh, AV essence data. In terms of the MXF header metadata, there are two kinds of metadata uh, for a header metadata. One is called a structural metadata, which describes to the AV material along a timeline. Another is called a descriptive metadata, uh, such as a title or a genre or a synopsis or so on. And uh, because descriptive, descriptive metadata does not influence the unit value at all, we will focus on the structural metadata. And below picture, uh, the, it is a simplified tree structure of structural metadata. Here, uh, it starts from a preface set, and oh, <laughs> preface set uh, which indicates the type of MXF file, such as OP1A. Then below that, uh, we have our identification set, which uh, usually say, who created this uh, MXF file? And uh, content storage set, uh, as an umbre common umbrella, we have a uh, essence container data which bundles the essence data within a fi file body and uh, metadata in a file header. Then we have uh, two packages, so called material package and file packages. And here, uh, this is usually said that this package is used to describe every material along time by timeline. And actually, those material package and file package are most important uh, items uh, when we discuss the UMID application principle, uh, UMID application in MXF. Here, specifically, a file package it describes a material within a file. On the other hand, the material package describes output material. And one of the most uh, characteristic property of MXF is that what you have in your MXF, MXF file is not always the same as what you obtain at its play out. So here, I have a, a MXF file schematically shown like this. Then when we play out this, it could happen that only the initial two thirds of the internal essence is actually played out. As I said before, a file package unit describe our essence in a uh, in the file, while material packet describes the essence as a, uh, at play out. And UMID is actually attached to those uh, packages. 
And here, please recall that uh, uh, what we defined is that UMID identifies uh, what we will obtain at its playout. That's why it is uh, logical for the UMID attached to the material package to be regarded as a unique material identifier. Again, uh, as I said, uh, now, material package UID, this is the official name of uh, UMID uh, attached to the material package, is now to be used as a unique material identifier. Globally, uh, uniquely identify an every material or MXI file. This means that uh, the MP UMID uh, must strictly follow the UMID application principle, or it should constitute the UMID resolution protocol. And uh, it should constitute a UMID managed domain. On the other hand, file package uh, has, uh, uh, can be used, uh, don't have to be used uh, as a global unique identifier. So it can be used as other parts. Here, suppose we have a source material, original source file. And in this case, uh, both uh, material, uh, MP UMID and FP UMID must be new value with zero instance number. But when we retrieve our <coughs> uh, resulting material like this, then because we won't uh, manage the resulting result.mx in the same way as the source.mxf, we will assign a new uh, globally unique value for the MP UMID. So, but what happened to the FP UMID? Here, because uh, FP UMID does not have to be a globally unique, uh, it will. Uh, it is an option to uh, set such a value that it shares the material number of uh, MP UMID of source material. And if we attach, uh, if we assign such a value, then what happens is that if we resolve the FP UMID with uh, instance number uh, masked to zero, then uh, the resolution will return to the URL of uh, source MX dot MXF. As you see, uh, in this way, uh, now, uh, by just using uh, com uh, traditional conventional MX technology, you can realize a link back to the source material. So I'll slightly touch upon uh, UMIT resolution protocol. As I said, uh, UMIT resolution protocol, of, uh, the first function of UMIT resolution protocol is to resolve a given UMIT of every material to its URL. But, uh, but it, because it is sad if uh, we find the every material we, we've just downloaded cannot be played out. Uh, so it is kind for the UMID resolution protocol to provi also provide uh, uh, the basic technical metadata, such as uh, wrapper kind, code kind, frame rate, and frame size, so on, so that uh, you can judge uh, your desired material to be played out by yourself or not in advance. And uh, actually, the details of UMID resolution protocol is still under study. Uh, I will show a couple of plausible UMID resolution protocol. First, uh, because uh, this uh, mechanism is quite similar to so-called DNS uh, or domain name system, which convert an IP address to a URL and vice versa. That's why the UMID resolution protocol will be quite uh, similar, will become a similar uh, to a DNS -like protocol. Another one is a standard operation uh, in the case of UMI web service. In this case, uh, because the transport protocol, uh, uh, HTTP will be used for transport protocol. What we will define is a message structure to be exchanged between a uh, client and server, and also how the message exchange pattern. OK, uh, let me conclude my talk. As you now see, uh, UMID can be much more useful. But in order to do that, uh, uh, appropriate common rules for the UMID application need to be established. Second, uh, fortunately, uh, MXF already adopted UMID as its core component, uh, requirement items. So UMID in MXF has a potential power to be a media IT infrastructure for the file-based media system. And, but in, anyway, in order to realize this kind of scenario, we need a standard, such as a UMID resolution protocol, as well as a UMID application principles. That's all.
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yoshiaki. I appreciate that in-depth coverage of UMIDs. I'm sure most of us didn't understand it quite to the same level in which you do. And any questions on this? We have, we have microphones here. While you're thinking of a question, I have one for Yoshiaki. Is there a best practice for creating a UMID where the materials are related? For example, let's say the material one is the uh, main HD content, and material two is the proxy of that. Is there any best practice in how you actually fill out the numbers in the UMID to say that one, is, one would, would be related to the other? Or are they just sort of random numbers after, after the header starts? Oh, in, in this case, uh, actually, uh, we have implemented in x is that uh, we'll assign the high resolution material with a global unique number. And uh, we assign a linking uh, UMID of, as a linking to, to the proxy so that uh, the proxy editing EDL can be directly matched to the high resolution. So you're editing. saying that if you have the high resolution UMID, so, can you find the proxy version based on it? That's my question. Oh, uh, from a proxy version to high resolution, it is possible. But uh, for, oh, no, uh, from high resolution pro to proxy, we need extra mechanism. I see. Okay. It would seem like a best practice there might be nice. So question here first, please. Yes. Question. Uh, you didn't really describe how you uh, are generating this, this UMID. Is it, is it uh, like one does with the UUID, the unique universal identifier, uh, which would use, say, uh, the serial number encoded in a device as well as perhaps time to the microsecond or something like that? I mean, there, there are well-established procedures for doing that, which would, quote, guarantee uniqueness in the universe. So how do you generate the UMID? What's your method of generating the UMID? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, uh, UMID, uh, SEMPT-330 specifies uh, several creation methods. And one is uh, also, uh, basically, the, uh, the algorithm is the same as UUID, which means uh, globally unique no network node plus the time at the creation. OK. Thank you. You talk about wanting standards for UMID resolution protocols and application principles. Do you have any kind of proposals or, or white papers or, or anything else that uh, makes any, any recommendations for which one could base such a proposed standard on? Or are you just uh, uh, requesting for, for information from the audience? Actually, the paper I have submitted for this conference is the first paper. <laughs> And um, I, 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 because I'm a simply standard member, I'm now planning to propose this kind of activity in the coming uh, simply. I look forward to seeing it then. Thank you. Yeah? I had a question about the UMID as well. Um, I was wondering if you considered creating the UMID using fingerprints because you want the identifier to be not just random numbers, but it's derived from the essence itself because mm -hmm you want it to represent the essence itself. So if you base it on fingerprints that are derived from the audio and video, then you automatically have an identifier that represents the content, and it will be unique if the content is unique. Hmm? Can, I, can I rephrase that question? Yes. So if, for example, in the next talk, we'll talk about a hash. If you took a hash of the content, which would be one number, let's say it's 64 bits, mm -hmm. you could use that number not only to identify the content's integrity, but also embed it in as part of the UMID, as yes. an example, right? That's an example. Right. But the fingerprint would be more robust. The hash is very sensitive to bitstream changes. Yeah, but the problem is a fingerprint, mm -hmm. though, over what, what time period, if it's an hour-long program? We can take fingerprints that, uh, for a few seconds, maybe. Yeah, so yeah. it gets into an issue of yeah. which part of the content is relevant for the fingerprint. Yes. Whereas a hash would be the entire piece of content. Okay. Anyway, so if any, any thought about generating the UMID based on the something about the content, yeah, yeah. some fingerprint or something like that? Yeah, that, but uh, actually, the how to create a UMID is specified in the same T330. Same and unfortunately, uh, they don't define such a method for the moment. Okay. Well, that concludes this talk. Thank you, Yoshiaki. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa.